hot hour of the day. Um, I had originally uh, suggested we do some kind of talk or panel with involving everyone and sharing experiences, but it's kind of difficult on a stage like this. So I'm just going to present my slides, which I had prepared anyway, and um, I'll invite you all to our village afterwards for a discussion. Whoever wants to talk about uh, details of certain repairs or exchanging um, exchanging any uh, ideas for repair cafes and stuff like that. Um, also, during the talk, if you've got any questions, please interrupt me at the spot and ask, and I'll uh, try to clarify it. So, welcome to Repair for Future. I'm Andreas or Fraxinas or RepairFox. I'm an electrical engineer from Germany. I'm developing software in my day job and I founded a repair cafe in the hometown uh, Aschaffenburg of mine. Um, I'm a member of a makerspace, Schaffenburg e.V. There's also a company called Schaffenburg in the Netherlands and they make office furniture, but we're not affiliated. Also, we're not sponsored, sadly. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, giving uh, tips in a live TV show in uh, Germany's ARD um, every once in a while. And I founded another repair cafe in my home village just a few months ago. So somebody once said, in a way, everybody is a hacker. Everyone has their tricks to deal with technology in everyday life. And um, that person was uh, Bau Holland. It's German. Irgendwo ist jeder Hacker. Jeder hat so seine Tricks im Alltag, mit der Technik umzu umzugehen. Es gibt tausend Kleinigkeiten im Alltag, wo es wichtig ist, mit Technik möglichst effektiv und ohne Angst und einfach sicher umzugehen. Ja, yeah, so what he basically says, it is hacking to deal with technology and problems in your everyday life. So uh, everybody has heard the word life hack. Uh, that's pretty much uh, the gist of it, I think. And that's why I, I do these talks at hacker con conferences and camps like this, because I think uh, there's just uh, such, such a, a, yeah, a closeness in mindsets that we should really work together like this. Uh, yeah, let's see, there's another slide. And, of course, I brought some motivation. This is a photo from today. My friend woke up this morning laying on the ground because his air bed uh, was uh, leaking and all the air leaked out, so we had to fix it. Of course, I had patches and uh, PVC glue and we could repair it. Yesterday, our crepe maker in the village broke. The switch broke. It is... Uh, a spare part that would cost like two euros or 50 cents um, but the regular consumer would have to throw the thing away it's out of warranty uh, it has special screws that you can't open without um, a yeah, special tool set what should you do usually it would be throwing it away we just shorted the switch and we can use it again so who hasn't heard what a repair cafe is Okay, I will explain. <laughs> so a repair cafe is um, a kind of meeting where uh, volunteers like me um, go and help people seeking help, trying to repair something and can do it themselves and show them to help themselves. So it is a kind of repairing together socially and um, it is, of course, meant for helping people who may be unable to afford replacing or something. And, of course, it's also there to stop people from just throwing it away if it's easy to repair and replacing it with, with a new uh, bought item. Um, to save resources and uh, keep it out of landfill. And just 
some 40, 50 kilometers uh, west from here in Amsterdam was the first organized repair cafe in 2009, um, where, yeah, where she pretty much formalized this as an event. So people have always helped each other in neighborhoods and, and uh, yeah, and helped each other, other repair stuff. But uh, the way our society works today is that people aren't so close with, with their neighborhoods anymore and stuff like that. So uh, it wasn't easy finding somebody who's not a professional to repair things. And even uh, it, even for, for professional repairs, it's hard. Usually people get told, no, we can't fix that toaster. That doesn't make any sense. We The time it takes us to open it is more than a, a new toaster would cost. So what we do at a repair cafe is a lot of times is tending to those uh, products that aren't really worth much anymore anyway, and people would just throw them out without really thinking much about it. Of course, sometimes it's a flat TV that is just out of warranty and maybe costs a thousand euros, and it's just a tiny little diode for 50 cents that blew. We've seen that before too. Yeah. So anyway, um, it was Martin Postma from Amsterdam who formalized this and uh, founded the Stichting Repair Café um, in 2010. And they have this uh, starter set, which works kind of like a franchise with a squiggly logo, which has changed by now. It's not quite as squiggly anymore. Not much prettier either, though. And... <laughs> And um, there, it's it's very uh, successful. So there are hundreds of repair cafes around the world, if not thousands, uh, hundreds in Germany alone. And um, big cities have multiple ones. Um, some work all days of the week. It's uh, yeah, it's become a real movement. So there are other, uh, how should I call it? It's not really organizations. It's more like a yeah, collect collective uh, collective uh, yeah organizations. So in Germany has uh, the Netzwerk Reparaturinitiativen. Um, actually, all German-speaking countries, Austria, Switzerland too, and there are 950 um, members uh, listed, out of which. They probably aren't all active anymore. Maybe some of them were a one-time thing or so, but it's a couple of hundred, and it's really amazing. And uh, the United Kingdom has the Restart Project, um, which is London-based, and they are really professionalizing. They even have uh, fix factories now, uh, what they call it, uh, where people can uh, go with... Uh, with their devices, and and they really have professionals uh, that do uh, that do this as a full time job, like you would repair uh, would expect or would have expected back in the good days from your TV uh, salesperson in, in uh, next door. And um, yeah, of course, internationally and strongly in the United States, there is iFixit, founded by Kyle Weens. And they have a big online community with uh, many repair manuals. Um, and they're also strongly lobbying for the right to repair movement in the United States. And of course, there's also iFixit in, uh, in the European Union, based in Germany. So how does a typical day at a repair event look like? This is our logo from Aschaffenburg. We uh tried incorporating all the the different uh, things that we do like sewing and uh electronics uh woodwork bicycles mechanical stuff whatnot into that and um the the motto is uh we can fix it together pretty much so we have these little uh, slips of paper that people write their names uh, in and what they brought. So a toaster and what the defect is. It doesn't heat anymore or it doesn't stay down. We try to uh, to ask them at the entrance um, 
what the exact problem is, because otherwise people will just write doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and it helps the repair people uh, if they have a slight idea of what's going on. And um, of course, on the other side, there's the house rules, uh, which mm, boiled down to say, uh, if if it fi if it breaks for good while trying to fix it, then yeah, it's bad luck. Things like that. Yeah. And then um, our repair uh, helpers take the um, take the slips of paper off of the blackboard and then ask the people to come to their desk and then they start fixing it together. Uh, the repair helpers bring their own toolboxes, the stuff that they're uh, used to, what they can work with well, like their own multimeters and uh, whatever screwdrivers or not, soldering irons sewing machines, uh, glue, stuff like that. And then um, usually there's food, like the name Repair Cafe already implies. Um, of course, uh, by the way, there aren't all called Repair Cafe. That is just, yeah, uh, the Stichting Repair Cafe expects them to be named Repair Cafe, but you could just as well call it uh, repair initiative or cafe kaput or something like that <laughs> there's there are so many creative names for them yeah and um, we started with coffee and cake as well and uh, sometimes we also cook it depends on where we uh, do our um, event we always uh, change locations after each look uh, each event and um, sometimes the people there prepare, like in this case, it is uh, some Turkish food. Yeah, uh, we've got uh, usually got some bicycle repairs going on. And yeah, fixing clothes or uh, dolls or toys, all different things. So people bring the funniest stuff. Last time somebody brought a, a pool cleaning robot something that crawls over a floor of a pool <laughs> yeah and then yeah we ha all have uh, set up our little tables with um like here billy is is fixing some blender or i don't know what and there's somebody fixing something else and yeah people sit together with the repair helper and they watch and they uh, if they can, they'll hold something or unscrew it themselves. And sometimes people will even um, do it all by themselves. So they just need a little hint every once in a while. Uh, this is the city major at the first event. Um, and that is me eight years ago or something fixing the, uh, the kitchen uh, machine of, of his wife. Okay, and... Um, yeah, sometimes like CD players or hi-fi devices, uh, especially like tube devices, are really time-consuming to repair and have to be a lot of measurements done and we need a lot of spare parts. And then that goes out of scope and time range of what we can do in a repair cafe. And then sometimes people uh, like take them home privately and continue it there inofficially. Yeah, so um, maybe you remember, luckily it's all over now, but there was a pandemic <laughs> and it kind of hit the repair cafes as well. Uh, there was a lockdown in, in Germany, I think here in, in the Netherlands as well at some point, and we couldn't do anything anymore. We were very uh, unprepared for it. And uh, so many um, appointments were just canceled. But... Um, for example, Repair Café Aschaffenburg started uh, already a, a month or something into the pandemic uh, into experimenting with uh, remote services. So we would offer a, um, a Jitsi instance where people uh, could log in during the uh, the time that was uh, scheduled for, uh, for a Repair Café. We always do that once a month at a Saturday. And we had... Uh, leaflets printed, so the appointments were already known, and instead of just cancelling them altogether, instead we did it online on our Jitsi instance. 
Um, I'll show a little bit in, in another in in the next slide how how that could work. And then um, after the lockdown, we did uh, the the events offline with additional hygiene measures like uh, disinfection and social distancing and a limited amount of guests that had to pre-book. Uh, yeah. This is just a list of um, different repair cafes uh, doing online uh, events just like we did. And something that is uh, noteworthy, especially at these kind of conferences, is that most of them used open um, open solutions for the video conferencing. Like a lot of them use big blue button or Jitsi. And um, just a, a few of them use uh, proprietary stuff like Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, some of them were even provided by makerspaces. Yeah, so how can online repairing work? This was during our first um, online repair session, and there's a, a guest, and she uh, was uh, trying to fix a, a video projector, and um, we helped her uh, disassemble the case, which is always very hard, <laughs> even if if you have it on your table in front of you, but if you have to, um, if you have to remotely. Uh, tell a layman or a layperson how to to open something like that up. Then it's really difficult. You can you can see it's an electronic device, so it has mains voltage in it. Of course, we unplugged it all, and it was basically just diagnostics. Um, but we could tell that this uh, th this this one power regulator had blown, and. Um, she was even able, like you can you can see here is a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> After like trying to get it open for an hour and a half or something, she saw that this part had blown. And we were able to uh, order the um, spare part. And then during a, a later time, when she came into the repair cafe, we could solder it and switch it and repair it that way. This would have been usually something where a person would have to come to the repair cafe twice because, of course, we can't have all special parts on stock. Um, yeah, with a video resolution, especially with WebRTC, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the the inscriptions on the parts are, of course, not readable. So um, some of the repair initiatives, they uh, um, started using out-of-band high-res photography for uh, those kind of uh, diagnostics instead. But what is cool is that you can open a repair manual and then show her where the clips are and uh, things like that. Or if a person has uh, computer problems, you can uh, help them like with a team viewer or something. Um, yeah, then after the these experiments of the separate initiatives, there was um, a bundled approach by the network. Uh, Reparatur Initiativen for basically all of Germany um, where helpers from uh, the different initiatives uh, could log in and then uh, help guests. Um, and that was uh, a week in um, February 2021 where we did that for every, every evening and uh, afterwards uh, we did it once per month. And in the beginning we had quite some uh, guests, like in March, there were 40 guests and over 20 helpers and 10 repairs altogether. Some people just wanted to, to check in and see how it could work. Um, but that uh, steadily uh, went down the hill. So in the end, there were only repairs, repairers, but no guests uh, trying to get anything fixed. So we turned it into more something like a, a monthly meetup of the repair community. Because this uh, network uh, repair initiatives also did um, like meetups of, in uh, the different regions of Germany and uh, um, like a, f a federal uh, for for the whole country 
uh, once a year and that couldn't take place either, which was very sad because uh, repairers really need to repair. Like I know it for myself. If we can't repair something, then we get, uh, yeah. So we, we were always waiting for guests that we could have. Um, good. So why do we even have to do this? The problem is um, that in Europe alone, this is a number from two years ago, I think, or last year. When, when was that with that giant ship being stuck in, the, in that canal? It was last year? Yeah. So imagine 60 of those giant things filled all the way with waste, with electric waste is, is what Europe alone produces every year. This is it's unimaginable. It's uh, 20 kilos per person per year. And um, we want to basically be a, an impulse and, and give, give people yeah, a way of changing their, their thinking and the way they consume, especially electronics, but also clothes and textiles. And um, we're trying to kind of kick off a political process too. So there is already uh, the uh, European Eco-Design Directive, which, for example, has brought us LEDs as uh, light bulb replacements or uh, vacuum cleaners that have a, a limited wattage, um, stuff like that. So some of those things are very, very good. And there is also, since last year, an amendment to the Eco Design Directive that is supposed to uh, improve a right to repair. So in the first step, this applied to just a few products or product ranges like um, coolers, washing machines, uh, dishwashers and displays, so televisions mainly. And um, it requires them to be uh, repairable without uh, special tools or at least the cases should should be openable without special tools, and that uh, spare parts need to be supplied for a few years. So uh, it's I think it's seven years for the displays and ten years for the um, for the appliances, and um, repairing and service manuals need to be supplied. Uh, so this is already in effect as of last year. Yes. The question was, um, spare parts, how does it work out in practice? Um, so in practice, the rule is they need to be supplied within or provided within 15 days for professional repairers. And there is no rule for the price of them either. Uh, yeah, unluckily. And um, also, there is no rule that keeps... Um, manufacturers from from bundling um, spare parts into giant modules like uh, uh, the, the rule doesn't tell them only to uh, um, supply or provide the bearing of a washing machine drum it can be the whole drum including a bearing that can't be changed so this is not perfect yet is this what your question was about no Thank you. Very good question. Um, so what's going on this year in 2022 is that our um, Europe, uh, European Parliament has voted for a right to repair on April 7th. And um, that means that the European Commission has to or should come up with, a, uh, with an amendment to the directive in uh, this fall, 2022. And um, so the idea is that there should be incentive for repairs that could be, for example, uh, tax reductions or some kind of um, um, vouchers like uh, Austria already has this in place. When you, uh, when you uh, go there and you get your washing machine uh, fixed and it costs 200 for labor and spare parts. 200 euro, then the Austrian government will pay 50% of that back. So you only have to pay 100. This is really cool. 
Does the German state of uh, Thuringia has that too now, but uh, only a limited uh, budget, I think. Yeah, and um, of course the um, uh, service manuals and software updates uh, have to be provided uh, for a certain period for a broader range of products. Um, yeah, and the the rest is, is it's, it's it's not very very. Uh, concrete, but devices should be more robust, uh, easier to repair, and wear parts should be easy to replace. Uh, this is it's always a question of definition, but it's it's a start. So another good thing is that uh, consumer information about repairability should be improved and warranties extended. Um, best thing would be, in uh, in my mind. You buy a washing machine that is projected for a 10-year lifetime, and then you have a warranty for 10 years. That would be the best thing. Then people can choose, do I want the 300 euro machine that has a two-year lifetime, or do I want the 1,000 euro machine that has a 10-year lifetime? The, if you do the math, then it's easy. Which one is the, the better choice? Huh? OK. Um, Another thing is that is technically already illegal, but um, it would be really illegal then. <laughs> the practices leading to worse or worsen repairabilities that planned obsolescence should be banned. Yeah? So if I put uh, a little fuse in that breaks after uh, two years or after the warranty is over, then it would definitely be illegal. Yeah? It hasn't exactly been proven in before a court i think that uh, some manufacturers manufacturers put these kinds of uh, things into devices but we all know that they exist like just think about printers which stop working after the the little excess uh, ink sponge is full when they think it's full yeah and um, another thing that uh, uh, should come is the digital product pass uh, with QR codes uh, that contains um, extra information about uh, like energy consumption and repairability and uh, things like that. I need a sip of water. So, friends already has a repairability index since last year for a couple of uh, products. Um, and um, this number uh, shows uh, pretty much how difficult a product is to repair. Uh, the bad thing is that the manuf uh, manu manufacturers calculate the score by themselves and there are a few uh, categories uh, like um, the uh, uh, yeah manuals and stuff like that that can um, increase the score even though they aren't really easy to re repair. For example, iFixit has the 36 easy steps that you have to do to switch a battery on a Galaxy S21 and it still scores 8.2, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah, in the United States, um, it is illegal that uh, companies, or it's not illegal to put them on, but they are null and void. You all know these uh, warranty void stickers on devices. Since 1975, courts have ruled that, yeah, they don't mean anything technically. Um, and also, it's very interesting that the American rights to repair movement uh, got traction because of a very conservative uh Groups of product, uh, group of products, uh, it's tractors by John Deere. Yeah, they put DRM and stuff into their machines uh, that would um, keep farmers from repairing their equipment on field. Uh, imagine the tractor breaks; they have to do, uh, they have to bring in the crops and. Yeah, you can't put it in the shop. They have to fix it on spot. That wasn't possible anymore, and that was a, a real uproar and um, attraction to the right to repair movement. Uh, last year, President Biden signed an executive order empowering 
um, right to repair. And there have been a couple of state uh, legislations this year. This is the last one being the Fair Repair Act of New York in June. Um, Germany has the round uh, table for repairs, who, uh, which does lobbying. And we, um, I'm a member of that too. And we managed to even get a uh, right to repair into the coalition contract of the governing parties um, of this um, legislation period in Germany. And uh, like I've already mentioned, Thuringia and Austria subsidize repairs. And just last week, India has announced that they also want to introduce a right to repair law. So what can we do? Please repair stuff for yourself. Uh, YouTube has uh, very good, sometimes, sometimes uh, not so good <laughs> uh, videos of how to repair, how to open um, things that happen again and again. Like what do I have to do if I need to switch the thermal paste of my notebook Dell X, X, XYZ or something like that. Um, check that out. iFixit has very many repair manuals, very specific step by step with high res photography. Uh, what do I have to do if I want to replace the display of my this and that phone? Um, if you don't have the tools at home or if you aren't capable of doing it yourself, come visit a repair cafe. They'll show you how it works, if it's possible. Or if you're already adept at repairing stuff, please volunteer as a helper in a repair cafe. Or when you're a member of a makerspace, why don't you offer some consultation hours in um, your makerspace where people can come with their devices or volunteer um, at a at a repair event. Yeah, and last but not least, if you live in a rural area that doesn't have any repair cafe yet, you can always open one. There are uh, there's the Stichting Repair Cafe for the Netherlands. There are they are also active all over Europe, and they have their starter set. Um, it is worth it. it uh, a British study, so British studies show everything. Imagine what they have a study on it. But this one shows that repairing actually has an impact on uh, CO2 reduction. And uh, it's, yeah, it's about one to 10 kilo per kilo of device repaired. Um, yeah. What we personally can do as well is think twice before buying stuff, especially gadgets, especially IoT crap, which may just as well stop working next year when the manufacturer decides to turn off the cloud, things like that. Do we really need it? Um, yeah, cherish and uh, service and maintenance uh, loop your... Uh, you loop your bicycle chain and stuff like that, decalcify your coffee machine, clean your vacuum cleaner filters, that will extend their lifetime. It's important. <laughs> and um, use a warranty to the end. If something is broken uh, within uh, the warranty time, even if it's just a stupid LED light bulb, then get it replaced. Yeah, it's that is uh, it's something that, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they even have an extended warranty of like five years or something. But it's a it's a tedious process. People uh, or the manufacturers try to keep them, yeah, keep them from from uh, using that. And um, of course, another good thing is. Teach kids how to solder and uh, do making classes. Soldering is a very important repair technique. Um, it is good if they know how to do it. Upcycling. Um, if a TV uh, mainboard is broken, you can still use the backlight for a really cool uh, shadow-free desk light, for example. There are a bunch of initiatives. Um, there is a FixFest, which is an international repair conference in um, Brussels 
in September or end of September, beginning of October, that first weekend. And there's also Bits and Bäume conference in Berlin. Uh, unluckily, they're both at the same weekend. <laughs> My dream, uh, first one I already said, uh, if a product supposed to uh, last 10 years, please put, it, put a sticker on and then actually extend the warranty to that time. And uh, what we need is uh, really a uh, Europe-wide return system for functional or easily repairable goods. Um, Belgium has that with the Kringwinkel. Uh, you don't throw stuff away that you don't uh, need anymore. You give it to a central instance and then it's being given out again for a really low price or repaired um, by, by, by some welfare jobs and... Um, we have that in Germany now for uh, for people who have fled Ukraine uh, and they're um, taking old laptops and computers and giving them away again to the refugees after installing a free open source um, operating system on them. Yeah, then of course some incentives for repairs would be nice as I've mentioned. And also, please... Always keep in mind, regard the ecological impact of every purchase and social impact. Some people have to assemble these things and those people don't live good lives. Some people have to dig out tons of uh, stuff from the earth to make uh, enough uh, cobalt for, for, a, for a phone or for a car or whatnot. Please always consider that. And not only the production, also the, the disposal is bad for our planet. Yeah. Eventually, we'll become a degrowth society if we want it or not. It, is, it would be better if we did it voluntarily and be prepared for it. Discussion. We barely have any time for it. Maybe there are some questions. If not, you're invited to Unterland Village on Olsen Field at 6.30, I would say, in half an hour or so. That would be great. Yeah, 23rd person to show up gets a free smartphone repair kit from me. <laughs> hey, did you hear that, you guys? You're lucky to one. First of all, before we start our... Thank you. This was excellent. May I have a big applause for this fact? Cheers. Thanks. I know that uh, there's still 10 minutes for questions. I pushed him a bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, I hope I didn't rush through too fast. So, but there were some interesting questions. And, and maybe, yeah. Yeah. Let, and let's get to the microphone because... I, I think we have a few more. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for the very interesting discussion uh, and talk. Um, I think what I wanted to say is uh, regarding uh, warranties. I think a lot of people aren't aware that the European law states that you have two years at least, mm -hmm. but it's at least. So yep. if it's a washing machine, it the law is a bit vague, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it states something as uh, as much warranty as you should be. Uh, um, as the lifespan should be. Yeah, as the life as you as you could meaningfully expect mm -hmm. the product to last, which mm -hmm. is vague, yeah. which really helps the manufacturers to. Uh, yeah. Uh, get out of uh, warranty claims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we had. If we really had a compulsory label uh, where the manufacturer has to write the projected lifetime of a product on uh, on the packing, then people would be able to to choose and and really claim that right. Yes. Yeah. That warranty. Yeah. But that's not in the proposals yet. It right? is. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It, it is in in the proposal that uh, the lifetime has to be written on and the warranty has to be according that okay. is not like that yeah mm. unluckily okay but, good. but we're trying to push it that way yeah. <laughs> keep pushing keep pushing <laughs> That'd be great. And a second question if uh, uh well, i don't see anything anyone queuing okay. up yet so yeah i, uh, I attended a few uh repair cafes uh, around the holland and i noticed the atmosphere was sometimes 
quite uh, of the participants. I mean, um, more kind of like they brought their product, dumped it, and sometimes even went out. They okay. weren't really uh, invested or really uh, huh. paying attention. Yeah. Do you have any tips, maybe, for uh, uh, hmm. how to to get the right kind of engagement? Let's say. Mm, so we've seen that too. The people were like misunderstanding the concept of a repair cafe yeah. as like a professional repair shop a free or repair, e yeah. professionally even free repair mm -hmm. shop and uh we always made clear that um we're here on our free time and then we want people to understand and to help and at least watch uh, if they, yeah. they don't have to to manually help um but um, I think it's uh, probably about communication, like writing an article about what you do in your local newspaper with photos and stuff like that. That always helps. And we rarely get that. Really? So okay. maybe once or twice a year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. That's, That's uh, better. <laughs> good to hear. Thank you. There's a few people lining Thanks. up, so let's bring Hold it on. on. Hey, um, I often find myself in discussions with like uh, companies that I buy products from and they claim to be very, uh, you know, uh, lifetime products and then uh, something breaks and then they're like, uh, okay, we'll send you like a new one. And I'm like, mm. no, I, I don't want a new one. I want you to repair. And a lot of times I also sort of offer them clues for like how they could like send repair kits to mm -hmm. all of the people who have this broken. And I don't know, these are companies like, for example, Reigns, you know, the rain jacket from Denmark or Gregory from like backpacks or Stanley. Mm -hmm. And it's always like very, I never get to like a good solution. Mm. Um, I just kind of want to create awareness for them to repair the stuff instead. So I guess none of the laws apply here, but do you have maybe any tips of like how to communicate? I think it's also mostly I communicate with a person who is not actually able to, and I don't get mm. to anyone who can influence that. Yeah. So yeah, the that law is not in place yet, but it's it's also supposed to be forbidden to uh, throw away um, like new stock or just uh, slightly defective and repairable stuff. Um, but the problem is that p uh, that products aren't designed to be repairable anymore. Like a lot of times, you can't even open a case of a product without destroying it or um, shoes. Or backpacks, like you mentioned, they are all glued together. They can't be soon or anything. And if they fail, then they, then sometimes they do fail for good, and then they need to be replaced because the, even the manufacturer can't fix it. But in these cases, I actually fix it myself. I mean, the yeah. thing with the rain check, but I okay. want, I want, yeah. I want them to do it, and I want yeah. them to also do it for other other people. I mean, yeah. They were totally fixable, actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. maybe they would have been, could have been designed better, but. Yeah. But they may not even have the facilities anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And indeed, I think I, I, I see the problem that you wanted to repair it. And yeah. And yeah. You get and a it's, new it's one, most really people are happy about it. Yeah. But. Uh, yes, but it, that it's not the right thing. Your... Yeah, yeah. No. It doesn't make sense. Hi there. Thank you very much. I was. I was, I was vaguely familiar with uh, some of these uh, movements, initiatives in Europe. Uh, very pleased to uh, learn more about it. Fascinating, uh, excellent stuff. Now, uh, from what I've seen, it seems to me like the place that would be the most, uh, I don't know if I can say advanced, but uh, that has the strongest culture of repair like that. And uh, unfortunately, not necessarily out of uh, such uh, noble motivations, but more out of necessity, mm -hmm. is Cuba. Mm -hmm. it seems to me like Cuba is the fix-it country. Yeah. I mm -hmm. uh, was wondering if there's been uh, any uh, formal or informal, some kind of uh, exchange with uh, Cuban repairers or if, uh, yeah. Thank you. Not that I'm aware of. That's an excellent question. And let me bring this up. If you look on a map for repair initiatives, then imagine the Iron Curtain. They almost stop there. Uh, so east of uh, like yeah. Germany, Poland is all, all already very sparse. People there yeah. 
don't need repair cafes. Because they, they can still, still do it. They can yeah. still do it themselves. Yeah. And yeah. they do. Like I was in, in Romania a couple of years ago in a very uh, remote town of Sulina. Um, their next hardware shop was uh, two hours by ship. <laughs> there aren't yeah. even any roads there. People need to be able to fix them uh, their stuff on their own with and improvise and they do yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. they don't need repair cafes mm -hmm. and cuba is probably the same way thank you for this suggestion <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks yeah. a lot thank you and our last question for today hi i i don't really have a question i just have a, a, a suggestion um, I know in Switzerland there's a big initiative now trying to copy the repair vouchers. They're very inspired, and I've been pushing the local councillors to um, activate that. So they're working actively on it, and also they're trying to attach a reuse centre to their recycling centres. So mm -hmm. if you can all contact your local councillors and push for that and say you want a reuse centre for all your equipment, because if you're also running a repair cafe, I'm sure you know this too, Andreas, mm -hmm. trying to get the spare parts, often you can take it out of another machine that has a different part broken. Yeah. So that would also be nice to just collect all these things as spare parts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Excellent suggestion. Thank you very much. Please do that. <laughs> okay. So that's it for tonight. Um, I, I would like you to, to thank you once more for this Beautiful story again. <laughs> I love it in this in this that, that we are we're doing high tech and low tech at the same time, and it doesn't really matter. We just do hacks. Yeah, right? exactly. Thank you. <laughs> People, give yeah. hand.